Welcome to the Low Post Podcast Live from Los Angeles, California. Wow. A wild night in the NBA, headlined by a fracas between the Minnesota Timberwolves and the Golden State Warriors that began when Clay Thompson and Jaden McDaniels were jostling and jersey tugging for a rebound. They started pushing and shoving, and then in comes Draymond Green, slaps the million dollar dream. On Rudy Gobert, Rudy, ah, hands up. He's got his hands up. I'm not doing anything. I thought the ref was going to raise his arms like to see if they drop down three times like they do in the WWE for the for the su- effective submission. Uh, and Draymond was ejected. Clay was ejected. McDaniels was ejected. I would be blown away if Draymond Green, given his history, is not suspended. Um all of this overshadowed another win for the Minnesota Timberwolves and the Brandon Pajemski explosion that happened for the Warriors. The Timberwolves are now eight and two, first in the West, first in defense. The Warriors have fallen to six and six. And look, as we welcome in Kevin Pelton, we have to start with the sleeper hold heard around the world. Uh, the image of a wide eyed Gobert. I mean, Rudy Gobert just can't in things that are very serious and things that are very almost funny, just can't avoid being in the spotlight for like bizarro reasons. That image of a a bug-eyed Rudy Gobert hands up and Draymond slapping the sleeper hold on him will go down in NBA meme history forever and ever and ever. If you want to read it sympathetically to Draymond, which I really do not, you would say that us looking on television with slowed down replays and close up shots, it's easy to see that um, that Gobert did not have his arms around Clay Thompson's neck. He kind of had his arms around his chest. He was clearly trying to be peacemaker. Maybe from Draymond's perspective, in what is a chaotic, fast paced, blurry environment, he sees his teammate being yanked around and gets angry about it. But that's a very generous interpretation to what it was clearly an aggressive act that just went on and on. It was like a 30 second sleeper hold. If Draymond Green is suspended and I suspect he will, it will be justified. Just an absolutely bizarre sequence of events. Two minutes into a highly anticipated in, was it an in, it was an in-season tournament game too. The it, IST, it was, yeah. my pick, the Minnesota Timberwolves from day one, damn it, were my pick for absolutely no reason other than I was high on the Timberwolves to win the in-season tournament. We're all in it to win it, baby. This franchise hasn't won anything meaningful. Let's get to let's get the first IST. Um, real quickly before we get to them, KP, last Friday on this podcast, the Warriors were six and three. And I said to Howard Beck, there's a weird dissonance watching this team where for like five minutes, they're like, oh, they're the Warriors. Like, yeah, it looks like the Warriors. That looks like a real team. And then for the next eight minutes, it's like, where did that go? Why do they seem kind of uncertain about who should play with who? Um, is this bench thing really working? Or is this just a product of like really bad opponent jump shooting that will come back to bite them eventually? Why can't anybody put the ball in the basket other than Stephen Curry? And I said their next four or five games or Cleveland, Minnesota, Minnesota, and a couple other good games after that. I want to see if they can get a signature win because they don't really have one other than the second or third game of the season against the Kings. And they did not get a signature win. They lost all of those games so far. They are 13th in offense, 12th in defense, 11th in net rating, facing a Steph Curry knee injury that appears to be day to day and no big deal. But look, any game without him is, is more likely a loss than a win at this point. A Draymond suspension. Clay can't get going. Wiggins another eh game last night. Panic button is too. Or they're talking about: Are we going to start Sarich now over Looney and start Sarich at the four and Green at the five or however you want to conceive of it? That group's only played twenty five minutes together. KP, I had them in my second sanctum of title contenders outside the inner sanctum of of four: Milwaukee, Boston, um, Denver, Phoenix. I had them in the second sanctum. Um, ahead of Minnesota, actually, although I was very high on Minnesota and, and had them as a top four team in the West. Do the Warriors just not have it? What's your worry level on the Warriors? Moderate. I mean, it's interesting. I came on this podcast in October and took the Warriors under at 44 and a half or Ooh. whatever it was. 
Maybe, maybe it, was, it was more than that, I guess. I forget what the actual number was, but I is, think it was like one of my seven and a half, maybe yeah. 48 and a half. And for the first six games of the season, I was feeling very regretful about that decision because it seemed like everything was playing out as they had hoped. You know, all of a sudden, the Warriors are not inept whenever Steph Curry is off the court because of the fact that they've got another Hall of Fame point guard. And that was, you know, exactly what they were going for in that trade. But, you know, now you take a step back. And I think one of the things we talked a lot in the offseason about the starting lineup and, you know, whether Chris Paul would be part of it. And a big part of that discussion was they had the best net rating of any lineup in the league that played at least 250 minutes last season. And it turns out that 250 minutes is actually still not a very large sample for lineup data. So I, I mean, part of it is obviously that Clay Thompson and Andrew Wiggins are not playing like they did last season, but part of it is also just that opponents are hitting 53% of their threes against the starting five. It's, this it's year. crazy. I looked up that stat today because their that lineup is minus 21 for the season in 87 minutes, 112 offensive rating, which is eh, 126 defensive rating, which is like sub Hornets territory and then your natural thing is well let me see the threes and that's where like oh that's weird is that almost encouraging in a way because that can't keep up yeah a little bit it, it, at least you know as far as this lineup no longer works i think speaks to to that element of it i mean clay this time a year ago was shooting even worse from the field so you know the idea was that he was going to have a stronger full 82 game season this year because of the fact that he was able to play pickup and work out normally all off season, which he wasn't able to do uh, in the summer of 2022, coming off those back to back lost seasons and just having returned, and that hasn't come to pass. But I don't think like Clay Thompson probably hasn't forgotten how to shoot. Wiggins is a little more worrisome to me because it's not just shooting. It's also, you know, some of the numbers that tend to stabilize quicker. His assist rate is the lowest of his career. He's getting way fewer corner threes than even back in the Minnesota days. So that's a worrisome sign for me. But uh, can he get a Brandon. rebound? Could, could he bother to get a couple more rebounds? I mean, that's never been a strike for Andrew Wiggins. Just get a couple. Just get a couple. I mean, he's had a couple of high flying ones in the last few games. We're like, okay, there he is. And then it's just like, then you're like, was he in the game for the following nine minutes? Because I didn't really notice. Also, the shot blocking, which is something that came to life when he got traded to the Warriors, is back to Minnesota levels. So, you know, all these athletic slash hustle indicators are troubling, which is consistent with what people have said about him coming into camp out of shape. But look, here comes Brandon Pajemski to save the day. Uh, you, no you already warned me that there's <laughs> going to be an extended Pajemski. And look, Steve Kerr said after the game, he's in the rotation now. He's playing. He rebounds. He connects. Nobody likes the word connector more than Steve Kerr and other Warriors people connect. They just want uh, everyone to just connect, 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 let's connect off the court. Let's connect over text messages, connect, connect, connect. Um, it's, it's amazing. They never brought in Rondo given his connect four prowess. That's not bad. Um, but look, I mean, this is like that, that comment, if he means it, like when Steph comes back to, he's in the rotation. When we got everybody, he's in the rotation. That's a shot at the bow of Moses Moody, Jonathan Kaminga, like, I don't know who else, but like, you're getting crowded with guys now. Well, Moody's the guy who's actually played well this season. Yeah, like, he's he been was fine. Entering last night, he was second in wins above replacement player on the team, partially because, you know, Draymond hasn't played very many minutes, uh, the games he missed at the start of the season, and then the ejection the other night. Uh, Kuminga, though, bottom five in war coming into last night's game, Wiggins was so last sad. in the league. So that's... That's the spot that's troublesome. And I mean, I'm, can it, I just disregard warp just because I want Kaminga to be good. So I'm going to just j disregard the entire well, stat. Just take the preseason warp where he was in the top 10 in the league. So that, that I think they changed the formula between the preseason <laughs> and the regular season in a way that makes it invalid. No, there you go. That makes sense. Uh, but if you're, if you're subbing out one of those guys for Pajemski, you're taking a team that already is small and is having trouble playing against these physical front courts of Minnesota and Cleveland that they've faced the last few games here and making them even smaller. So as excited as I am about Pajemski, who is number two in the, uh, stats only version of my draft projections, uh, this year, the, that, that is a bit of a worry in and of itself. Can I just read the Gobert quotes from last night in case people have missed them? Because I, not everyone can see everything. This is via John Krasinski at The Athletic, although a lot of people had these quotes. They were sent to, to the scrum. 
This and this is after Draymond, a day after Draymond did everything he could to try to get under Anthony Edwards' skin. What are you gonna do about it? You think I'm gonna give you a layup? What the f are you gonna do about it? And Anthony Edwards is like, who? Like I got I got nothing to say to you. I'm just gonna win the game. Uh, and and now Rudy Gobert is saying after last night's fracas, it's kind of funny because before the game I was telling myself that Steph is not playing. So I know Draymond is going to try and get ejected because every time Steph doesn't play, Draymond doesn't want to play. It's his guy, Steph. He'll do anything he can to get ejected. Okay, strong, strong. Then he talked about Steve Kerr saying uh, Draymond was just trying to come to Clay's defense and doing the thing the Warriors have done 45 times now, which is like try to explain away something that Draymond Green has done on the court. Um, what do you want me to say? He's backing his guy, but I think he knows. Deep inside, he doesn't want to say it, but his guy is a clown. Oh, boy. Wow. First of all, now this is a rivalry. Like, this is a whole thing now. And this goes back to Draymond making fun of Rudy Gobert for crying when he got left off the All-Star team in 2019, I think, which I thought was kind of a cheap shot, but everyone likes to take cheap shots, cheap shots at Rudy Gobert. Um and look, I've I've been a Draymond like I love as love him as a basketball player. I love his his fierce approach to everything. But some of the stuff he does is just it's just not this. Like last night was an escalation. He's going to get suspended. And this is this kind of reflects a changing tide of like some of these guys are just announcing a we're tired of you and b we're not frightened of you at all and we don't care. And we're just going to say out loud what we may be say, saying amongst ourselves in the locker room. Those are, those are quotes. Those are, those are pretty strong ass quotes from Rudy Gobert. Um, I got nothing more to say, except that's, that's a wow moment for a guy who's been a punching bag for a lot of his career, including a personal dream on green punching bag. He's punching back now. And he is, he's not, it, it's a twist of the knife to say, to imply Oh, his own team knows. He, his own team knows. He, he, Steve Kerr's not being honest. He knows he's a clown. Like, I, I, obviously, he can't. Rudy can't know that. But that's that's a that's a knife to the gut right there. I mean, this obviously like is deeply personal for Gobert and Draymond Green in some sort of a defensive player of the year way. I think. I think that uh, Draymond, you know, has cast doubt on Rudy's defensive player of the year win. So if we have a steel cage match between the two of them. It has to be for a one of the trophies, right? Draymond Green is definitely bringing like the brass knuckles tucked inside the trunks into any steel cage match. Like, there's no question that there would be there would be some shenanigans in in uh, you know dirtiest player in the game level shenanigans. Um, I look Warriors. I'm I'm worried about the Warriors. They just don't look they don't look very good, and they have stuff to trade. So. We're not at trade season yet. We're going to talk about uh, trades later. Um, I don't see like obvious great candidates for them yet. It's a little too early, but I I'm officially on Warriors watch at this point because it just these these games that were qu- kind of early season testers have not gone well. Let's talk about the other side of the coin, which is Minnesota, uh, eight and two, still just twentieth in offense and. Uh, you know, it's weird because their offense has actually been very good with their starters on the floor. It's been very good with both Cat and Gobert on the floor. 115 offensive rating, plus 39 in 221 minutes with those guys on the floor. And the lineups kind of break down as you would expect. Like, together, plus, what did I say, eight, seven and a half, eight. Cat by himself, plus 15 per 100 possessions with a high offensive rating and a good defensive rating. Gobert by himself, plus 15 per 100 possessions. Low offensive rating, minuscule defensive rating. Again, as you'd expect, better defense with the Rudy lineups, better offense with the Cat lineups. Um, Nas and Cat is a solid plus 15 per 100 possessions. Nas and Gobert, plus 14 per 100 possessions. Almost every big man combination is working except Nas by himself, Nas Reed, who's been amazing off the bench. Those lineups are being blitzed in, in, in limited minutes. Um, And yet their offense nets out at 20th, despite the fact that they've shot very well from three and they are number one in mid-range shooting so far in the league. 
I can't really parse that. Like, should I be worried that their offense is 20th despite really good jump shooting? I'm I'm netting out on no. Um, the offense, particularly when their best players are on the floor, passes the eye test for me. I think Towns has started to figure out how and where to pick his spots to attack when Gobert is on the floor and Gobert is the main screen setter and Towns has to sort of toggle between spacing the floor and finding ways to attack from the perimeter on in, finding times to duck in in the post, finding times to attack switches when they run their double drag action and he pops off a flare screen from Rudy and gets a switch. Conley looks good. McDaniels looks awesome attacking closeouts. Like that passes the eye test to me um, offensively. Uh, obviously, they're, they're, I don't know if they'll be a top eight offense, but I think they're going to be better than 20th defensively they're just gigantic across the floor and like they're built to be a pretty good defensive team i when malika andrews on one of our nba today youtube episodes asked all of us for spicy takes because we were talking about spicy food this was before the season started i said minnesota top four seed in the west and i'm starting to wonder kp is that underselling the wolves like is this it is this are we full on like this team is a championship contender now I don't think I'm ready to get there yet. I mean, is this the point where I do the thing where I talk about opponent three-point shooting? Sure, do it. It feels like the the Simpsons meme. Say say the thing. Uh, opponents are hitting 31.5% against them so far, the lowest amount in the league. And you can parse this 100 different ways I have. I, I looked at it another way, like, you know, teams that allow between 31 and 32% over the first 10 games of the season – the rest of the season opponents hit 36%, which is precisely league average. Like it just doesn't tell you anything about how they're going to defend threes. The rest okay. Of the season. But even so let yeah. me pour cold water on top of your cold water. Okay. I believe you're, you're pouring hot water on it, right? I don't know. Maybe I'll pour coffee. Um, they're second in opponent free throw rate, which is a very, which for them is like, I don't even know. That's like, are we living in the twilight zone? Like the wolves learned how not to foul. I don't even know what to do with that piece of information. They're still eighth in forcing turnovers. And it's hard to do that while not fouling to have an aggressive style that gets you a lot of turnovers and also not hack away and hack away, which is by the way, a warriors thing. They foul everybody all the time. And they're 29th in opponent free throw right now. And they're about average in defensive rebounding, which for the wolves is like average, average, average. We figured out how to box out. Awesome. And the other glass of hot water, I would say, is yes, 31% is not sustainable. They're so far and away the best defense that if they allowed 36% on threes the rest of the season, as you are saying, what do they fall to? Fourth? Like, they're going to be a really good defense regardless, right? Well, that was a really good guess because one of the things I did last year – when I was looking at this question is if you take only the shot quality, according to second spectrums, shot quality metrics, and then the other three of the four factors that you talked about, what is that projected defense is going to be, you know, at the end of the season and the Minnesota Timberwolves going into last night by that met metric I came up with were the fourth best defense. And I think they're probably going to be a little better than that because some of what they're doing in terms of opponent shooting is they're also number one in, uh, you know, reducing opponent shooting relative to their shot quality in the restricted area. And that's something that does tend to stabilize much more quickly and is very useful when you have a bunch of seven foot guys. And one of them is a three-time defensive player of the year, however many times Rudy Gobert has won it. Yeah, people don't want to hear this. Rudy Gobert is going in the Hall of Fame. I mean, look, I imagine, just imagine if Minnesota won the title. Just, just imagine it for a second. All of the clips that would be recycled from everybody trashing the Gobert trade as an all-time disaster would would recycle and everyone well, look what you said two years ago look what you said two years ago look what you said two years ago i still think qualitatively like it was not a good trade they gave up way too much they were not bidding against anybody and it's kind of a trade that has them in jail like they almost have to make the finals for it to have been worth it the outlay of assets um but look they're playing unbelievably well and their size like i highlighted this on nba today yesterday there was a play in the first warriors game where Steph came around 
a, a screen from Looney, I think, clean. Look, if you freeze it when he gets around the screen, Jaden McDaniels, who guards everybody, guards Steph, guards bigs, guards smalls, guards mascots, guards everybody, gets hit by the screen. And I think it was Gobert is maybe a step too far back. And if you freeze it at that moment, it looks like death for the Wolves. Like, we've seen that clip a million times. Steph has space behind him and in front of him. That's an open three. Jaden McDaniel, first Gobert kind of stunts out at him. And Gobert's a large guy. Jaden McDaniels is so big that he recovers, flies at Steph, and Steph mid-rise up, it's like, oh, a 6'8", whatever dude is coming at me. I got to stop. Brings the ball back down. Goes back up. And Jaden plants, jumps back in front of him and disrupts the shot. That's like size people think of as big guys at the basket. They just, there's just less space all over the floor. Passing lanes, driving lanes. There's just arms everywhere. McDaniels looks unbelievable on both ends of the floor. And Ant, we haven't even mentioned Ant, like, I I still think he's got a ways to go as a passer, but he's definitely better playmaking this season than last season. Like the Ant Gobert pick and roll already looks like a completely different animal than it was last year. And it's not even that Ant is hitting Gobert, which he is now and then. It's the skip passes to the corner. It's all of those kind of plays that he's making in addition to all the crunch time shots. If you're If you're asking me why can't they win the title, I'm I'm kind of running out of answers. Like it, other than like um they're the wolves and bad things happen to them. They do match up well with Denver. I think that's a real thing, but I I would still put them like who are you confident is definitely better than them in the Western Conference? Denver and I, who else? Yeah, I think that's the right way. Just Denver? It. Yeah. I I mean, look, we haven't seen Phoenix play with all three of their their big three together. Uh, apparently that's going to happen tonight. Uh so that'll be interesting to see, but None of the, you know, there was a lot of talk going into the season, maybe even in the first week of the season, about how strong the top of the Western Conference looks. And I don't think that's the case anymore. So there's very much an opening for the Wolves to have, you know, the season that the Kings had last year, the regular season, and, and get the number three seed, uh, you know, if not the number two seed. And the, to to go back to what you were saying about the Rudy Gobert trade and all the criticism of it, the criticism was not this team is going to be bad with Rudy Gobert. Absolutely. You know, this is what we expected from them last year was for them to be a high forties ish type of team that because of the fact that they were putting more emphasis on the regular season might finish ahead of some of these super team conglomerates that we have more faith in, in the playoffs, but you know, or dealing with injuries and lack of depth throughout the regular season. So yeah, I think it's playing out that way. And to your earlier point about them in the in-season tournament or your, your projection about them, this is always the kind of team the in-season tournament was designed for. Like, I think people had this vision of, you know, I don't know who's a Orlando, let's say. I, I mean, that may be selling Orlando short, but someone that's not even going to make the playoffs is going to make this incredible run through the in-season tournament. Like, probably not even over a four-game stretch. You know, they're, they're not going to get that hot. But Minnesota is the precise kind of team that, you know, now is is the favorites to win their group in the in-season tournament and has a chance to win a game or two along the way and, and maybe get to the finals in Vegas. Yeah, baby. Um, here's the, the only take I have on the in-season tournament, I like it. I think it's going to be fun. I think it is fun. I like most of the courts. The Lakers court in person last night I was at the game was really nice looking. I don't know how it came off on TV. It's a lot of yellow. It's a lot of yellow. I was told by some photographers at the game it doesn't photograph particularly well for artistic reasons I don't understand. My only major criticism is I can't keep track of who's in what group. So, like, we're talking on TV yesterday, like, if the Lakers win tonight, they're going to have a stranglehold on Group B. I'm like, I don't even know who's in Group B. And I know they did it by conference and they did it by team quality. I'm wondering if they need to just do the groups should just be the divisions because I'm never going to remember who's in what group and like sit there and care about who's where and who's why. Like, I just can't remember. And I think that's one thing um, I would consider Uh, on Minnesota. The only last thing I'll say is I don't quite remember a situation like this where a team is this good with this much single season upside and they have a lot and everyone there must know this team will not look like this next year, almost no matter what, because financially the McDaniels deal kicks in. Kyle Anderson's a free agent. 
Mike Conley's a free agent. Nas Reed has a new big contract. Like, they just can't pay all of these guys. They'll be so far into the tax. They'll be, like, Warriors level into the tax. Like, forget, like, oh, we're Milwaukee level into the tax, and we do that because we have a good team and a generational player. This would be, like, no small market has ever paid a bill like that. And they're just, there's just nothing they can do about it right now. They can't – It's they can't – shed. they're too good. They can't – any decision – they're so good that any decisions about the future – must be put off until this season plays out its course. Yeah, usually we only see it with teams that are like defending champions or at the end of the run. It's the the last dance situation that, you know, we've seen with the Warriors perhaps multiple times over the course of this run. But, the, and that's the criticism of the Gobert trade is, look, this is the season where they are most all in right now. And Anthony Edwards is 22. And like, he's very good. He's... Well, probably all NBA caliber now, but is this the best Anthony Edwards is going to be? Probably not. But I mean, that was the underlying bet of the Gobert trade. It was a bet almost as much on Anthony Edwards as it, as it was on Rudy Gobert. It was a bet that this dude will be ready in short order. You're right that he's going to, I mean, like he's not even in his prime and he's already this good. They look like they're going to win that bet. Like, even if he's 85% of the player he'll be in four or five years, that player is still effing awesome. Okay, let's get to sadder uh, news. The Bulls' uh, stink beat got a little uh, juice yesterday when it was reported by multiple outlets, including Casey Johnson out of Chicago, that Zach Levine and the Bulls are open to a trade the bulls are four and seven they have a friendly schedule coming up though like this could be a bizarre situation where they kind of string together a few wins uh but they just don't look very good and the halcyon days of lonzo ball kind of tying this whole thing together are long gone and you can pin the whole demise of this team on lonzo's injury there's uh, they clearly would be better if not much better with him when you pay Zach Levine, Nikola Vucevic, and DeMar DeRozan, all of whom have made recent all-star teams, the amount of money that they're paid and the pedigree that they have and what was traded away for them, Franz Wagner, Jed Howard, Wendell Carter Jr., a pick still going out to San Antonio, you can't be outscored three years in a row with those three dudes on the court. I don't really care who the surrounding talent is. Um Zach Levine makes forty million this year, forty three next year, forty six the year after that, and has a fifty million dollar player option in twenty six, twenty seven. It's a lot of money for Zach Levine. It's a lot of money. I heard Brian Windhorst saying on his pod today, you might you might want to buckle up for a disappointing trade return if you're expecting like blockbuster, like three picks, two young players. I would agree. Um, Zach Levine just hasn't won at a high level in the NBA. I don't think that's necessarily his fault. He plays a part in it. Um, there are certainly worries about his knee coming off the ACL thing a couple seasons ago. He's recovered fine, but there are still worries about it. And I'm just telling you what people are saying. Um, I said to you, let's build some fake, let's build some fake Zach Levine trades. I will give you first bite at the apple. I mean, to me, there are only two teams that should really seriously be thinking about me. Oh, boring, trade. but fine. I mean, no, no, no. I mean, we're going to talk about the other teams, but the teams that actually should be making this trade that we should be focusing on are the Lakers and the Toronto Raptors. Oh, I'm so glad you brought up Toronto. No one is going to bring them up and they are on my list right here. It says <laughs> Tor, Tor. Okay, you're gonna, you're gonna do, need to do, the, do, do the obligatory Lakers one. Just do the obligatory Lakers thing. So, I mean, the, if we're matching salary the closest, it's Russell and Rui Hachimura and the the first round pick that the Lakers could trade, which is either 2029 or 2030. The interesting question there is, is, is that enough for Chicago or do they demand that Austin Reeves be in that trade? Oh, uh, no, then we're not making the trade. Like, we're just not doing it. Um, before the late, Austin Reeves is not in the trade. D'Lo and Rui, I think you need to add money. Um, otherwise, the Lakers are taking back an extra X, like, five million or something, right? Like, I had Vincent in there, but that puts the Bulls over the tax. The Bulls are not far from the luxury tax themselves. I think they're like 1.5 under or something like that. That's the trade. D'Lo plus Rui plus whatever else plus that one pick they can trade. That's the trade. It's the only trade the Lakers have. They're not – I would – if they trade Austin Reeves, 
in a Zach Levine deal, given how they've built up Austin Reeves. Yes, he's coming off the bench and he's playing quite well. And and given that Alex Caruso got away from them to the Bulls, it'd be, it'd be Caruso 2.0. Like, I just don't think that's that uh, that's even a net gain for the Lakers if if they put Reeves in the deal. I just don't think that does that does anything to help their team. Um, okay, let, that's like we'll see. The Lakers, they've talked a lot about continuity and you know, they've they've scrounged up they're over five hundred now, scrounged up some wins, managed without LeBron. Uh, to get a W, Anthony Davis looks really good. Vando hasn't played. Vincent has barely played. Like I- I'd like to see the team before I start trading him. It's interesting before and, we get to, and they will because I don't think Rui can be traded until January fifteenth. Yeah, right? all of this is January, like December fifteenth, January fifteenth. The whole Lakers' whole roster is January fifteenth. Guys who signed, a whole tradable roster. Before we get to Toronto, I'm so excited you brought up Toronto. Um. Uh. Philly did not come up and Philly's not one of your teams, despite the fact that they did this whole, like we got assets for James Harden. We want to flip them for an all-star level player. Yeah. But what has happened, you know, before that trade and and especially since it with the, the 50 piece he dropped the other day is like Terry Maxey's too good offensively for me to need that other player to be someone who is maximized with the ball in their hands. And then just defensively a Tyrese Maxey, Zach Levine backcourt. It's not going to work at the highest levels. I I just I'd rather take my chances in free agency than make that trade as Philadelphia. I would too. Um, Any time a guard, and Zach Levine's a wing more than a guard, obviously. But any time a minus defensive perimeter player who leans to guard, you know, more than big small forward. Anytime, even a point guard like Damian Lillard, we just went through this with Damian Lillard. Anytime a guy like that hits the trade market, people start fake trading them to the Knicks with Jalen Brunson or the Sixers with Tyrese Maxey or wherever there's another small guard that's already there. And you kind of have to stop yourself like that. Is that a defensively viable situation against elite playoff offenses? And perhaps it is not. And obviously it would it would vaporize their cap space. As, as the Sixers that you're using your cap space in that trade ahead of free agency. I will say on Levine, you mentioned the ball in his hands. What's always intrigued me about Levine. Like that, I'm talking five years ago. So this is old news, like way old news, irrelevant news. This is not a relevant thing. Now, please everybody understand this. There was a little bit of intrigue in Denver about how Levine would fit on their team five years ago, four or five years ago, not now. The Nuggets are not doing anything with their team now. And the and the thinking was, we have Jokic and we have Murray. In a role where he's the third option, and all he's got to do is finish plays when our best players are on the court. Take all the decision-making out of his hands. Cut for dunks. He's a good cutter. Run around for threes. If you have the ball and you're making decisions, it's secondary, late in the shot clock, and you can just, in a pinch, do stuff. And that's like that's the Philly fit, particularly with a defensive anchor behind him. I agree with you. I wouldn't do it. Um, yeah, it's that, not that I don't don't think it would work offensively. It's that the benefit he would provide offensively would not be enough to make up for the defensive problems it would create. Totally understand. And like that, but that's that's the template offensively for Levine. Like Sacramento is on my list as a a sneaky fun Levine team. Just because I just don't think they're going to hit the next level if they're starting Herder, Barnes, Keegan Murray at two, three, four. I just don't think that's good enough. As high as I am on Keegan Murray, who's going to be very, he's already good. He's going to be very good. And they can, you know, again, December or January 15th, Barnes, Herder, and one of Monk or Trey Lyles get you to the money. You're going all in on offense at that. You're not going to stop anybody at that point, building around Fox, Sabonis, and Levine. But in terms of decision-making, he becomes a third option. He has a passing big man hub who can free him up for cuts, backdoor dunks, handoff threes, and a point guard in Fox who's the guy. Um, I think that's a very smooth offensive fit. They owe a pick to the Hawks, but they can get around that and have enough stuff to trade. I Again, Given the money that they already owe Sabonis, the money that Levine is making, the defense issues, 
I I don't think I would do it if I were them, but but I I would be very surprised if they did not at least have like an internal text chain going about like, hey, what do you think about this? Is this something we should do? They did they cross your mind at all? They did not cross my mind. I it does make some sense for the reasons you outlined. Barnes is a little bit earlier than January fifteenth because he his was an extension. They can trade him uh, December thirtieth. I think you got to really believe in Keegan Murray's defensive potential as a wing defender or your ability to find someone else to to slot into that spot for it to make sense. But I, I that's not as bad as some of the ideas that I, I think I think will be out there. Oh, thank you. But not Toronto, as bad. yeah, do Toronto. Toronto because I'm I'm very I have talked about Toronto with Levine before. And and the, the last time, whenever the Bulls were in the news for whatever reason, I mentioned Toronto as a spot that fits some of the criteria I'm talking about. Like, no, he won't be a primary decision maker. Defenders all around him, depending on who goes out in the trade. What trade did you actually build? Yeah, Toronto fits that in terms of they have all but one of their own just this year's protected pick to San Antonio, which I think extinguishes this year. So 2026, it goes okay. through 2026. So, so that does complicate things a little bit, but uh, if you're getting Zach Levine, you're probably sending out that pick to San Antonio this year, given that it's relatively lightly protected. But they can still trade 28 and 30. Like that's enough. They have enough draft equity to get in a game that I don't think is going to be as frothy as the Bulls fans hope it might be. And similar to Damian Lillard, one of the nice things they have is a lot of salary that they can cobble together. That is not very long-term Gary Trent Jr. Uh, in the last year of his contract, Chris Boucher with one year beyond this left on his deal, Thaddeus Young, who's not playing for them in the last year of his contract. That is close enough as a mat salary match for Levine that Toronto doesn't push into the luxury tax. Chicago saves a little money, gets tremendous cap flexibility going forward, and then gets some level of picks is the real return here. Yeah, Trent Boucher, Thad is $38.5 million. Big bam, boom, get a couple picks in, and Chicago fans aren't going to be excited by that. Fine. Like, I'm sorry. Um, you know, again, the, the Raptors need shooting and roving shooting and explosive shooting and ball handling so badly around Scotty Barnes and Siakam and Ananobi. He, he fits like a glove there. And I think their team is just okay. I think they know their team is just okay. It always scares me a little bit building trades like this with a team that already has so many major long-term decisions hanging over its head with Siakam and Ananobi and Trent all potentially heading into free agency this coming summer. It's just a lot. It's a lot of balls in the air. I agree that there's an interesting, there's an interesting fit. The other question we haven't talked about is like, what did the bulls want? It's a kind of a, like you, you hear a lot of different things around the league. Like, do they want to rebuild or are they actually looking for players that could help them win? I, win, I use win loosely. They're not winning, but help them win now. I don't know. I, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, Miami. The, the team that keeps not getting all the guards that hit the market, you know, they have $47 million of tradable salary in Kyle Lowry and Duncan Robinson, both of whom are very relevant to their team. Duncan Robinson is playing great. Check out Duncan Robinson's three-point rate this year, by the way. It's down to like 65%. It's taking a lot of twos by his standards. Um, you know, and they've got picks to trade. My gut says they would not trade Hero for Levine. Uh, I think they would just view that as if Zach Levine is better than Tyler hero. And I said this about Bradley Beal and heat too. He's not better enough to justify the increased salary. He makes like $15 million a year more and other stuff. We might have to attach to Tyler hero to entice the bulls to do this. Um, so I think it would have to be kind of a poo poo platter of Lowry Robinson picks again, Butler out of bio a dribble handoff, passing big, both elite defenders, third option offensively. I think Miami will kick the tires. I just don't know that they're interested enough and the Bulls will be interested enough in what they have. Did you think about them at all? I mean, to me, them and the Knicks are in the same boat where why am I going for Zach Levine now when I know that Donovan Mitchell could be a possibility as soon as next summer? And that may influence the timing of this trade and, and cause it to drag out into next summer, even if the Bulls are listening now, because, you know, the market is just not going to be what it is when that Donovan Mitchell situation is resolved. 
the only other team because they must come up by law in every episode of the Low Post Podcast. Like Houston is a no, Oklahoma City is a no, New Orleans I don't think, Indiana is a no, Dallas has looked in the past, but they spent their their chips on Kyrie as a no. I would guess anyway. These are all just educated guesses. You know who needs some guards? Orlando. They've just been so risk averse. But there is a world in which they could trade a bunch of stuff for Zach Levine. They have a, they have picks galore that they can trade. In addition to like they have the Gary Harris salary, Fultz's salary, Ingles' salary. Jonathan Isaac. Jonathan, I don't even know what to make. His contract is non-guaranteed for this season and next. He He's good when he plays. He plays 12 minutes a game. He's a, a walking minutes restriction. I don't know what to make of him. Um, And they could still have cap space this coming summer, depending on who goes out in the trade. The following summer gets a little dicier because if Suggs is on the team, his cap hold kicks in. Franz Wagner's cap hold kicks in. This is a, this is a franchise that's been hesitant to hit the gas. But uh, they can't shoot. They still can't shoot. Um, they are at risk of being a bottom 10 offense for the 12th consecutive season, which is a DiMaggio level streak of offensive incompetence. But they have real talent at the forward spots and it and, and their defense is number two in the league. I just I it seems like a little too much too soon. But again, start the text thread. That's all I'm saying. Jeff Weltman, get the text thread going. Um, any thoughts on that before we change gears? I mean, along those same lines, Orlando at least like has reason to feel good about the direction they're going in. And maybe that's the reason you make this trade because of the fact that like we actually could be competitive if we got Zach Levine in here. But uh, speaking of not pushing the gas, Detroit is still one of the league's worst teams. Detroit, but... Detroit can't get out of the garage and they just backed the car through the garage door. Forget stepping on the gas. They hit. They just forgot to open the garage door and just crashed right through their house. So, if if there starts to feel like some pressure, we need to to win and, and justify the rebuild. Then you know they've also got Joe Harris, James Wiseman, is some expiring contracts that uh, they could cobble together with some other salary. And you know they they also are a team that really could use shooting to unlock the young talent that they have. It's a little now. Their young talent is more on ball, depending on how much they believe in Jaden Ivey coming, who's coming off the bench right now. That's maybe the difference between them and Orlando. Let's switch gears real quickly. Uh, Chet versus Wemby was a letdown last night. Um, Oklahoma City blew the doors off the Spurs. Uh, let's use that as an excuse to talk about the Thunder, who are now seven and four, top ten in both offense and defense, seventh in net rating. Um, SGA is obviously just ridiculous. Um, Holmgren looks really good. I've been very impressed with Chet Holmgren on both ends of the floor. He is a force on defense at the rim, um, challenging everything. Obviously, they cannot get a rebound on either end of the floor. That's kind of baked into they start four wings in a in a very skinny center. Um, this team is really, really good, man. They're, they're better than I thought they were going to be. Um, Jalen Williams looks like a tank, just barreling into the rim, making layups 36% on threes. Um, I, it, I Everyone wants them to make a, a trade. Like, go for it. Win now. I don't know. Like, they have the Bertans $17 million salary. Not much more expendable salary than that. And I think to Sam Presti's point, I mean, they have the Michich contract that gets you to, like, $25 million outgoing. To Sam Presti's point from earlier in the season in his magnum opus press conference, it's it, like I need more information before I trade anybody out of like my top seven guys. Like I just I need more information about Josh Giddy. I just need more information. But this team, they're better than I thought they would be. I thought they were going to be like a 44, 45 win team. I think they're going to be better than that. I think the optimists will be proven right. What has impressed you about or what do you, what is your sort of early glimpse at OKC? Yeah, I think one of the questions that we had when we talked about them in the preseason, my projections were lower on them even than that is how seriously is this team going for it this year? Or are they still, still seeing this as a development consolidation year? And I think a couple of, you know, some of the decisions that we've seen so far suggest they are trying to win games right now. The first of those was obviously playing Chet Holmgren almost exclusively at center. Like I, I didn't see all of last night's game because of the fact that it got out of hand, but coming into that, he'd played like one minute with, 
Jalen, the big Jalen Williams. They did not play together last night unless it was in garbage time when I stopped watching. Yeah. So that's a win now move as compared to what we're seeing with San Antonio, where they're playing Victor Wembanyama largely at power forward, except when they try to win in the fourth quarter. And then he plays center and weirdly does way better. So then the other element of it is how many of these guys were going to be on scholarship in their rotation. Trey Mann isn't playing. Alexei Pokashevsky, after coming back from injury, isn't playing. Usman Jang was the one young guy who was playing, but now with Kenrich Williams returning, he was out of the rotation last night, uh, was playing in their G League game, is we're recording this podcast uh, in early tip-off time. This is all indicating to me like, okay, the the time for focusing on development is over. The time for winning is now. And for all the same reasons we talked about with Minnesota, the opportunity is very much there for them to be a top four seed in the Western Conference if they stay healthy. I mean, is there a trade you can find for them? Is there someone they should get? I think I, it's too early for me to have this conversation, even in my own head. And like again, I can't, I can't trade any of my like blue chip young guys yet. I need to know more. I think I do anyway. If I'm if I'm Sam Presti, I do. But like, when, like who's the guy that's making me break that stance? I mean, OG Ananobi would be the guy who would be a really intriguing fit with this group. I mean. <laughs> You know, maybe you you believe that Lugens Dort Dort is like eighty five percent of him, so why pay you know twice as much for more than twice as much actually uh, for the fifteen percent upgrade? But I, if there was going to be someone, that would be the guy. And I, the thing I will say on them in matching salary is the seventy five percent rule is going to potentially help them. True. True. Where they you know even if it's only. Uh, the Bertans contract and say Pokashevsky, who is in the last year of his deal, that still nets you back almost 40 million, I think, as long as they stay out of the tax. By the way, their starters plus 11 per 100 possessions. It's becoming a really good lineup. It's part of the reason I'm not ready to necessarily trade out of it. Dort's the guy, though. Dort more than Giddy. Giddy's too interesting and and too peculiar as a player and a passer. Um. I, I need to see more of him. What, what do you feel about uh, Slob Wizard, or as I tried to retcon it from John Hollinger's original, Wizard of Slobs for uh, Josh Giddey's? He was in passing. the first the first 10 things column of the year. Yeah. He was highlighted. And they bring him in the game just for that. If he's out of the game, they'll bring him in for that. Well, not his ability to do it. Th- that is a nickname. Oh, I don't like the word s- slob. Uh, real quickly, two minutes on the Clippers, uh, who fell to 0-5 with James Harden last night. Um, I don't know if you saw any of that game for the first time in the James Harden era and what an era it has been. Um, they look like a basketball team that cared. So congratulations. The Clippers did not walk around on offense. As Ty Lu said, they ran around on offense and cut hard and screen hard. They got backdoor cut dunks. And if you want, they, they like Kawhi, uh, ran a pick and roll with Zubats. They got Russ, a backdoor cut dunk. Uh, and the pick and roll was with 19 on the shot clock in the second half. Like that, that kind of Kawhi brought the ball up in the first half, the right wing had nothing kicked it to Harden sprinted up into a random step up screen for James Harden that got Christian Brown switched on to Kawhi. So you got a good matchup there and catapulted Harden right away into a pick and roll with PJ Tucker that got him an easy jump shot. Like they had some zip last night. They obviously played super small without any of their big guys and without Russ for a lot of crunch time, the lineup of Terrence Mann, Kawhi, PG, Norm, and Harden. Uh, Jokic ate it up in the end. That lineup is just going to be too small, I think, to sustain against some teams. But they're figuring they 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 tried some new stuff, more actions. Um, I just think they're going to find it tough sledding when any two of Tucker, Zubats, and Russ are on the floor. It's just hard to get action going north south at the basket. Like you want a Harden Kawhi pick and roll if Kawhi's got if Harden's got a favorable matchup that they can switch on to Kawhi. But then you can't take that to the rim if two of those guys are on the floor because there's just too many bodies there. And so you end up sort of jostling around the wing. There are ways to do it, but I just wanted to really quickly say everyone's tired about Harden and talking about the Clippers. They, they finally looked like a team that cared. They lost to Denver without Jamal Murray, but Denver's a really tough place to win with Jokic. They actually look like a team that decided to try to, you know, as Pat Riley would say, participate in its own rescue. Did you see anything notable? 
from them. Well, I think the most interesting part was the timing of what you mentioned about them going small, uh, you know, with, with Mason Plumley out, Musa Diabate didn't get any minutes as the backup center. It was PJ Tucker, you know, who again, did a really good, credible job defending Nikola Jokic when they were matched up. And then Kawhi is the center in kind of those completely five perimeter player lineups at times late in the game. And then hours after that, uh, the news broke as we're recording this. Woj reported that Daniel Tice has agreed to a buyout with the Pacers, and he will be coming to uh, play backup center while Mason Plumley is uh, out of the lineup for a period of time with this MCL sprain is someone who had barely played in Indiana after his really terrific performance for Germany in the world cup this off season. So as committed as they looked last night to play in small ball, apparently they're not at least over the course of the 82 game regular season. And that is the one, like the big picture takeaway for me here from the Clippers is like part of the justification for doing the Harden trade was regular season's inning to eater to make sure you don't get too low in the standings when Kawhi and Paul George inevitably miss time. They're in enough of a hole now that, you know, the chances of them getting up into the top four seem very unlikely, even if they're as good as, you know, they thought that they would be when they made this trade. Yeah, they finally, again, last night looked like they knew they were in a hole and like, can we start building a ladder or something to climb out of it? Can we do something? Like that Kawhi play I mentioned when he set that step up step up screen for Harden, that's the dialectic built into the team now is they're going to have to give the ball to Harden more, and Ty Lewis talked about wanting to do that. And if Kawhi is on the court with him and PG is on the court, Paul George has been, by by the way, their best player this season, and yeah, I think it, easily, easily. And, um, and their best on-ball player, which has yeah. been really interesting because you've mentioned how much Kawhi needs the ball to be effective, but you know, it's been PG who's been the best decision maker and, and scorer in that role. And the, that's the dialectic is the more Harden has the ball, the more those guys, if they don't commit to doing stuff like that random step up screen and slip to the basket and keep the ball moving, those guys get marginalized to the corners and the wings. And it's an effort to keep them involved when they're just standing there. They're just waiting to get passes from Harden. You can build an offense like that, but that. Those plays, they got a bottle because it's a way to get a little bit of everything at the same time and not just build the entire box out of James Harden. That's enough Clippers talk. We're going to bring in Mo Tequil to talk about the rest of the rookies. Kevin Pelton, we covered a lot of ground, my friend. Thank you, sir. Thanks for having me. Let's bring in a new guest, a fresh voice, to talk about some of the other rookies on some of the sad sack teams in the NBA. I am nothing if not a benevolent host. I want to shine spotlights on the Orlandos and the Charlottes and the Detroits of the world. Mo Dekeel, former video coordinator for the Los Angeles Clippers, which means you are personally cursed. Uh, you can <laughs> see, hear him on the Athletic Podcast. You can watch his video, uh, video series, One Mo Thing, which is a very enthusiastic uh, video series about something that happened in basketball this week. Mo, how are you, sir? I'm doing great. I didn't, I didn't know I was personally cursed by taking the job of the Clippers. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I think that I am personally cursed by having attended many Los Angeles Clippers games. It's just, <laughs> now we're recording this on Tuesday morning, I should say. So James Harden's fifth game with the Clippers is in about, 12 hours or something and maybe maybe we they'll beat the nuggets and everything will be fine i will talk about that game uh uh in a later segment okay i wanted to go rapid fire through i know see i know you are one of the people mo who is watching <laughs> charlotte and yes. watching detroit throw the ball in the general direction of the hoop and watching anthony black crack the magic starting lineup here and there because of injury. So I want to, and, and you're an expert. So I, I, I want to go through early first impressions of some of these rookies with you. Are you ready? I'm ready to roll, Zach. We're going to go in a completely random order. That makes no sense. Uh, Brandon Miller, the number two pick of the Charlotte Hornets, 13 points a game, 44% shooting, 28% from three has been starting for the Charlotte Hornets recently. Um, with Terry Rozier out, Miles Bridges is coming back uh, imminently. That will be an interesting lineup choice. Gordon Hayward uh, is a fantastic trade candidate, playing very well. Somebody should please trade for him. The Hornets are three and six with the ninth best offense in the NBA and the 30th de best defense in the NBA, i.e., the worst. Um, I have liked 
the Brandon Miller experience so far, despite that 28% mark from three. Um, look, it, Scoot has barely played, so it's far too early to even begin the premature process, the pre-pre-premature process of litigating this decision with the number two pick. But I, I, I like what I've seen from him as a complimentary, multi-positional wing guy, long on defense, works hard, um, a little tentative offensively with the ball, but I, I've liked what I've seen so far. What have you liked? Or disliked? No, I mean, I'm I'm with you. Like, look, the sh- he's getting good looks. The shots just aren't falling. Like, it's just, like, I feel like there's going to be a run where everything's going to kind of come together and he's going to hit shots and things like that. His, his three-point percentage, obviously, below 30. I think he's a better shooter than that. That's going to get a lot better, I think, just over time. You know, we're still in the early part of the season. And some of this stuff is weird for these guys as rookies. You know, they're used to playing, you know, during the early part of the college season is three games in a row. And then that's it for like a week practice, all of that stuff. It's a little bit different now in the NBA level, right. And everything, your new town each night and whatnot adjustment period for all that. So I think his shots will fall eventually. What I love about him though, Zach, and this is going to sound a little bit weird. He just moves like a basketball player glides almost at times, you know, and I see stuff where there are some possessions where he'll get the rebound, go coast to coast. And it's just kind of smooth. And it's it, it's it's almost I want to just say like pretty aesthetically. You see, pleasing. you see why he uh, has named Paul George as his favorite player and inspiration because Paul George is a a boss and b <laughs> an extremely glidy player. Um, yeah, I mean he just looks the part, man. Like he's long, smooth. They've put him on a lot of really elite ball handlers like Jalen Brunson. Right. You got to guard him, uh, Kyrie. You got to guard him and maybe switch on to Luca. Now and then, and like, look, he's getting hung up on screens now and then like rookies do, but he's game for that and has all the tools for it. Offensively, it's just kind of like he's he doesn't get to run with the ball all that often. Nine pick and rolls per 100 possessions. This is Lamelo's show, and then it's right. Gordon Hayward's show, and then somewhere down the line it can be Brandon Miller's show. Typically, that means he's spotting up off the ball, attack a closeout, and, and he's his kind of go-to is like catch, fake, one dribble pull up and eventually those will turn into more drives and more kicks but the pull up is looks nice like it's he's a he's a the shooting is as advertised like i think look 13 a game four rebounds he's careful with the ball he doesn't turn it over he already looks like a solid nba role player with the position and size and defensive want to that every good team is going to need. And that's like the floor 10 games in. Yeah. And like what you're, what you're talking about, like the, the one dribble pull up to the mid range, like when he gets to the elbow, it's, it's almost automatic. Like it just looks so fluid. It's so perfect when he gets there. But there's the other thing too, is every now and then, then he just explodes. Like the, against Washington, he nearly put Gafford on a poster. He almost dunked Daniel Gafford through the floor of whatever the Wizards arena is called. I mean, it was, it was, he he went after it and I thought he was going to get it, but he was like way above the rim. It was, it was to the point where it was so good. I don't care that he missed it. To me, he dunked on Gafford. Like just put it on a poster already. Like it was so pretty in the way it was. And it kind of just happened out of nowhere when you're watching the flow of the game. It gets kicked him in the corner. He attacks the closeout, drives baseline and just bam. And I was like, oh my like I jumped up and that's those things where it's like, it's there. And I think the one thing that's a little bit unfortunate, like you alluded to is he just doesn't get a lot of opportunities with the ball. And I think that's the tough part for him as a rookie, especially when he's coming from where he had the ball all the time in Alabama. And now he's got to adjust to that. And I think kind of figure his flow with all of those things. I don't know that any franchise has as much riding on a draft pick as Charlotte does on Brandon Miller and not because of the scoot thing, but because of all of the draft whiffs that we will not list here of the Michael Jordan era. And because in the past five years, they have spent top 15 to 20 picks, including lottery picks on Kai Jones, who's gone James book Knight, whose option was declined and miles bridges. Who's obviously, um, pleaded no contest of some very serious felony domestic violence charges and then has this new sort of um, protective order violation thing hanging over his head. Um, They need this to work out. And so far it's working out. And look, 
I, I don't know where the Hornets are, are really going medium term, long term, but LaMelo, Brandon Miller, Mark Williams is is interesting. Steve Clifford's a really good coach. What have you thought of uh, while we're here? What have you thought of um, LaMelo's play so far this season? He's one of the more I I am fascinated by him. I've written a lot about him already preseason and into the season. I'm curious for your take. I'm coming in cold. I don't know what you're going to say. Yeah, no, it's I need LaMelo to kind of just figure out like, hey, style doesn't matter as much. And I think that's kind of the stuff I'm hoping for from him. And I just don't know if we'll ever get that. Like, he just likes the flash and it's it's fun to watch and it's exciting. But it's just sometimes it's, you know, I just need you to go win games, man. Do, you got to do some of those things and, and and some of that stuff. I mean, 30th in defense, their point of attack defense isn't good. I mean, it's just like, it's just, you got to care about that end and you got to try way more. And he had a big stop against Indiana where he came up with that steal and that stuff. I need more of that. And I need to see, we need, I need to see him care on that end a lot more. And I just need him to start. He's all to me, he's a lot of style, no substance. But I think he can be substance. I think he can provide that stuff. I think he's got the skill to. I think it's just he's got to want to do it. And I think that's kind of the thing for me with LaMelo. I think his defense has regressed so far this season mm-hmm. from where it was in limited action last year to the point that, I mean, Steve Clifford before the season told me in an interview, like, LaMelo cares about defense. He wants to be a good defense player. He's not – He he said something like, guys who just go for steals wildly – just kill your defense and he's not one of those guys and I kind of think so far this season he's been one of those guys um and offensively I've always considered LaMelo just kind of a carnival and and like the step from carnival and you can win with a good carnival in the NBA like a guy who shoots a lot of threes makes a lot of passes and hit heads and all that you can win like 38 games they have won like 38 games with a good offense when it slows down and you get in the muck of okay, it's a half court game. I got to find a mismatch. I got to I got to carve into the paint on pick and rolls, change pace, get to the rim, read the layers of defense, not just kick it out right away and keep like that's where I'm watching him. And I think he's actually made progress this year. His drives are way up. His shots at the rim are way up. He's getting fouled more. The Steve Nash dribble, which Steve Clifford mentioned specifically to me, is something he did not do. He's now doing quite a lot. He's starting to slow down, get guys on his back, and and kind of try to read the defense. It's it's he's not finishing at the rim. He's like sub fifty percent at the rim, which is abysmal. But I like the process more from him on offense, and I like the process less from him so far on defense. Right, and I think that's, like, if we can just get a little bit more intensity on the defensive end of just solid, just be solid, don't gamble, I think we'd start to see it. We'd we'd feel a little bit better. I don't know if that will lift them out of 30 in the defensive rating, but I think we'll feel a little bit better of what we're seeing from him. Let's move to the uh, Detroit Pistons, who are not very good. <laughs> 23rd on offense, 20th on defense, uh, 22nd in net rating they are two and nine they've lost eight in a row and they have two rookies that i want to talk about marcus sasser and asar thompson i will let you pick which one you want to start with mo i want to start with marcus sasser but zach I, to be honest with the pistons i this is uh, is this can i air grievances like this is festivist time almost like i you have can, grievances can, with pistons is it is it that like they have no shooting. Well, I, you know what? Isaiah Stewart's making threes. You can laugh. I, I, you can laugh at the playing all the centers together. He's making threes. Is it that Cade is Cade's shooting line like clockwork is 41, 31, 47, and he, he he's struggling? Like, what's your agree? Is it Jaden Ivey being relegated to no minutes? What's happening, Mo? I don't understand how in this day and age in the NBA where we spend so much time talking about you can't have two non-shooters on the court that they start four non-shooters and i know some of this is bogdanovich's hurt stewart's the only guy that starts in their lineup that can shoot right killian hayes is shooting 32.5 percent, and that's up from him but killian hayes drives everybody nuts in the fact that he's getting the minutes he's getting 
Azur Thompson, who we're going to talk about, not shooting it well at all, and he was known not to be a shooter, shooting 15%. Cade, you talked about shooting 29%. When it's Whether it's Duran or before he got hurt, Bagley, those guys aren't shooting. How are you starting four non-shooters in the NBA in 2023? What What is your alternative plan? Who should they Mark, be starting? Start Marcus Sasser instead of Killian Hayes. Or I like, Alex Burke. I, 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 or anybody, just they have shooting on the bench, Zach. It kills me. Well, a lot of their guys have been hurt. Like Monty Morris has been hurt. Alec Burks just played his first game. Bogdanovich is still hurt. Um, so Sasser, ten points a game, three assists, three rebounds, an assist to turnover ratio of thirty four to nine, which yeah. I quite like in a rookie. Um, he's shooting forty nine percent overall, forty three percent on threes. And he has a sweet pull-up jump shot, a soft, soft, buttery runner in the lane. Doesn't get to the rim. It's fine. He has five free throws the entire year. Um, a little bit shoot first, uh, yeah. but but that's but that's fine too because he's he's making shots on a team that cannot make any. Uh, he's already shown. I wrote this in my column last Friday. He's already shown me it. He's like he's got that herky jerky like. He has such a quick burst. He he goes from zero to a hundred and back to zero. It's like his body's moving in different directions at, at the same time. Like he's hard for guys to corral. I've already seen enough where like I would I would I have seen no harm in starting him over Killian Hayes. Yeah, I just don't I just don't understand not to. But I think also the offense flows a little bit better. I think it helps. You start him with Cade. You know, Cade gets a little bit more spacing when he gets to attack downhill. And then it's a guy who you kick it out to, and then either he gets a wide open look or he drives. And I think you get a little more fluidity in your offense, a little more flow with all of those things. I think there's a lot of stuff with Sasser that, you know, is worthy of more than the 21 minutes a game he's getting. And I think he needs to to really get that opportunity to play. And the assist to turnover numbers for a rookie, and it's 11 games, that's insane. For a rookie, like we at least have, you know, by now 15 turnovers. Like there's just so many. He just does a great job of taking care of the ball and everything with that. He doesn't really kill you that much defensively. Like I think, you know, I mean, listen, he's fine. This, he's fine. Yeah, he's fine. He's he's six two, six seven wingspan. Like he's he's gonna be undersized against some twos and obviously threes, but Cade's size gives you sort of a lineup flexibility to play a smaller guard next to him. Now, this really this is really about Cade. Like, yeah. I, I've been a Cade believer the last 20 to 25 games of his rookie year. I thought he hit a groove of finding the right balance of getting into the paint, just kind of wiggling it in there, pivoting, faking, creating right. for others, creating for himself. Then he had the shin thing this basically all of last season. is We're early into this season. He's For this whole thing to amount to anything, He's got to become, I mean, look, all NBA, whatever, like that's a high bar. He's just got to become a, a a better player than he has shown because like like the, the Jaden Ivey thing has gone sideways. Hayes is is whatever. I love Duran. I think Duran is going to be a, a big time center in the NBA, but they need something to tie it all together. And that was intended to be Cade. And if Cade's just okay, I mean, this team, as is, is so raw and so far away from any sort of competency on offense in particular. Um, but, they, like, if you squint on the right nights and it's like Cade's running the show, <laughs> Sasser's making threes, Duran's rim running, Asar Thompson, who we're going to talk about, is doing, like, literally everything. Um, you can see, like, the outlines of something, but then the outlines kind of fade into oblivion under the – under the cloud of 9,000 missed jumpers in a row. Um, yeah, I, I, it's, it's, it, it's going to take a while, uh, for the Pistons. Yeah. I mean, it's a little, it's a, the thing about Cade, cause when you talk about that run he had at the end of his rookie season, I mean, there was a game against Brooklyn. I don't remember if they won or lost that game, but he made so many plays down the stretch of that game where I was like, this is Cade. This is the guy they need. This is the one that's, the, as you said, tie it all together, and this is this is what they're. He looked on. like he looked like, and I don't say I don't, I I don't want this to be taken the wrong way. He looked like JV Luca in 
in the, in those 20 games. And I, I emphasis on JV, like not right. like, I'm not saying he's going to, he, 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 even in that stretch looked like he was going to become 70% of the basketball genius that Luka Doncic is, but he has that style of bruising, slow, decelerating inside out passing. He, he, and size to hit the floaters and the turnarounds, which is what really makes Luca unguardable. He just hasn't found that groove again. Yeah, and I think that's the thing. I the the shin injury I think really set him back. You know, there was a lot of talk in the summer with how he played with USA basketball. I wish he actually played on the team and and was part of that. I mean, granted, they they were quite disappointing in the in the tournament they could have used him but like there was a lot of talk of how great he's looking at things and we just I haven't felt like we've really seen it this year but again I think it all comes back to it's just not a lot of spacing and as you said like Bogdanovich is out Burks just got back like there's a a a question of like they need to put shooting on the floor so he has those spaces to attack like it's one thing when you're when you do the drive and kick and you're kicking out to you know Killian Hayes and he puts up a shot, It's it's that doesn't end up being a, a an assist, and that hurts you. And I think those are the things, like, we want to, I want to see him get those opportunities with those guys. Can I give you just a, a Detroit stat that I – well, to, to your point about the spacing, by the way, the starting lineup is minus 11 per 100 possessions with an offensive rating that is just incredibly bad. Um, This is the stat that blew my mind. Free throws. Detroit is 30th in opponent free throw rate. They foul everybody all the time and they don't get to the line very much themselves. So like, like, let me go, let me get, dispense with these fancy stats and see just how many raw free throw attempts are they minus every game. They are minus nine free throw attempts per game. They average 20 a game and their opponents average 29 a game. It's like, it's like they're basically starting it's like they have to play the first six minutes of the game with four guys. I mean, you you just can't win with I, I don't know that I the last time I mean it's not like I check this particular stat regularly. That is enormous. Like I don't remember the last time I saw a free throw differential that big for a team. I mean, that's that's a wild stat. I actually never thought to even really look at that. Like I now I'm going to start paying attention to that way. You know, in game you might, but looking at it overall, like yeah, they're basically giving nine points to the other team almost the start of every game, you know, through the course of the game, they're going to get nine points somewhere. Okay. Now I'm getting brutal. Now I'm going to get excited. All right. I don't think I have ever rooted for a young player to develop a serviceable jump shot more than I am going to root for Osar Thompson to develop a serviceable jump shot because this dude can do everything else at a high level already. Here are his stats as a rookie on a bad team who does not get the ball very much. 11 points, 10 and a half rebounds. He's averaging a double-double. Three and a half assists as an off-ball option. 1.2 steals, 1.9 blocks. He's already sniffed around a 5 by 5 game. <laughs> um, he, he might be like one of the best candidates in the league already for the vaunted five by five game, which has become my mini obsession. He is, however, shooting 40%, four of 26 on threes, 47% on twos. But the cutting, the rebounding, the passing feel that he has kind of kind of just like in the flow of the offense, he makes these great connecting passes. Um, he reads the game really, really well. He is going to be a monstrous defensive player. Monstrous. I just... The basketball gods have got to give him a serviceable jumper because if they do, this dude is going to be really, really, real like all star level good. Yeah, and if and they it don't, if they don't, it's just like then you got to do the thing where you figure out how, like, okay, can we use him as a screener? Do we get a stretch five so we can finagle our team this way? Then it becomes a puzzle piece that you've got to awkwardly fit. Can we can we get him a shooting? Can we do can, do they have a shooting coach in Detroit? I don't know, but they should at this point, you know, and I think it's really important with what they have. I mean, that's the, that's going to be the difference maker for him. And it doesn't have to be. He doesn't need to be a 40 percent three point shooter. He doesn't need to be, you know, if it just needs to be enough to the point where it's like, hey, we can keep him on the court because we all know what happens. You know, the, the playoffs are a long way away from the Pistons, like long, long way. But 
the play in is a long way <laughs> right yeah and, and 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 just like that we know what happens at that point you know and everything he does on the other end of the court is so massive for them you know everything he brings to them you know the rebound the fact he leads all rookies with rebounds by about almost two rebounds two whole rebounds the next guy i think is victor webb and yama and he's at uh, eight and a half or, or or something like that. I mean, he's he's right. Just that's impressive from a guy that's the three man. And I think that's the things you're getting from him and the ability for him to be able to grab and go from that and then there create for everybody and and make things happen. Like, just think about it this way. Then Cade gets to sprint down the court and gets to play, you know, attack a rotating defense with Thompson coming up and bringing the ball up the court. But it's all going to come down to that shot, Zach. And that's going to be the most important thing for him. I mean, you knew I'm not sitting here watching overtime elite. Like I just read what the draft Knicks say and and I watch some clips here and there. So you know what he's pigeonholed as as he comes into the league, right? Like defense, effort, all sorts of athletic plays. Um, I didn't realize the amount of feel he has. Like there'll be moments in the game where the ball will swing to him and he'll like improvise like a fake handoff, like, quarterback keeper handoff Mm -hmm. fake it totally fool the defense one dribble makes the next pass and not the pass the defense expects the one that's like ahead of their rotations like two skips a link in the chain to the next i'm like damn that is advanced nba basketball if this like he could be a star if he can figure out the shooting piece yeah and that's and that's gonna be a big one and it's and and that's the most important one other one small complaint i have about him and it's and it's you know, me just being the somewhat of a, a jerk that I am is he does have a tendency to over dribble. Like there was a possession with the the Bulls, you know, one of those things. He gets the rebound. He brings the ball up the court. He tries to drive on Levine. Levine shuts it down, doesn't give the ball up. I, I think Duran comes to set the ball screen. He he attacks off the ball screen, drives into the lane, goes against Vooch. He's a ball's been in his hand the entire possession and he turns the ball over. Like there's a little bit of a tendency of. At a certain point, I think I need him to understand, like, okay, I didn't get the first attack. Let's get us in offense and get going and 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 get us moving. I think that stuff that will come in time. Again, rookie kind of is a little bit st- spreading out his wings here a little bit and trying to figure out what he can and can't do. But I think that's probably the one thing I'm besides the shooting that I'm a little bit like I want to keep an eye on. Can we talk about the Wizards? <laughs> Nobody's <laughs> watching the Wizards. <laughs> nobody should. Nobody should watch the Wizards. I watch the Wizards. I might and be cursed. <laughs> I want to talk. I want to talk about Bilal Kulabali, who was the seventh pick in the draft. The Wizards traded two second round picks to move up and draft him. Kind of a big swing. They got some intel. I think that some other teams were going to try to trade up or get him. He was Victor Wembanyama's teammate in France. And if there is a reason to watch the Wizards, both as a Wizards fan or just a person, a human person who somehow has ended up watching a Washington Wizards game, he's the best reason. Um, now, I say that he's averaging eight points a game. He is shooting 50%. He's shooting 44% on three, 60-something from the corners. And kind of like Asar Thompson, he came in with this, like, we. It, it, he was, you heard, um, like, almost Bruno Caboclo level. Like he's a couple of years away from being like a year away, not quite two years away from being two years away, maybe like a year away from being a year away, like a less years, (laughs) fewer years away. He's much less raw than he was made out to be. He's shooting it. Well, now the release is slow and he's wide ass open. That's fine. He's taking the shots and he's making them. He can catch and go off the dribble. He looks kind of calm and poised as he does it. Now he he he's got to learn to make the next pass in that situation, and that's fine. Um, they let him handle the ball in summer league. He looked okay doing that. They've let him do it in garbage time of some games in the real real season. Looks good. Looks okay doing that. Defensively, he's as advertised. Super long. Yeah. They've put him on everyone from Lamelo Ball to Pascal Siakam. Now Pascal Siakam lit up the Wizards in a just classic hashtag so wizards fall from a head loss last night <laughs> um but that wasn't all on Kulabali. i i've been impressed just because i was prepared for um deer in the headlights kind of rookie uh and he has not been that at all what have you noticed from him because this is by the way I, 
this is a big deal for the Wizards. The Wizards are clearly playing for both this draft and we're like six months away from people starting to talk about which team is going to position itself for Cooper flag in 20 right. to 25. Um, the, 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 the Wizards are very well aware. Like we don't have the guy. We missed out on Wemba Nyama. They were one ping pong ball away from Wemba Nyama. I was in the room watching <laughs> their poor tortured assistant GM realize that they almost got Wemba Nyama and then they didn't. Um, but even though Koulibaly is not projected to be the guy, he if if he's good and a, like a really good complimentary player, like okay, that's step one to finally we've reset. What have you seen from him? Yeah, I think the idea that he's a little more cooked than we thought is actually, in a, and I mean that in the positive way, not raw, uh, as we as we thought is is true because I think you know I watched a lot of Wemby's games when he was playing with Metro ninety two. I think most of us did, and. Koulibaly did look raw at that point. You saw the flashes and stuff, but you didn't see this stuff. He's shooting it way better than I ever thought he would coming and in. And by the way, it, it could fall off. It's it's not a high attempt rate. And like, he is just wide open. Like some teams are guarding him with centers when Muscala is at the five or Gallo, who's, I love how Gallo, by the way, has just slid all the way up the positional spectrum. He's a three, <laughs> then he's a four. Now he's coming in playing backup five. So they're putting wings on those guys and centers on Kula Bali, but like he's making shots. He, and, and, and that's going to change at some point. Somebody's going to look at the scouting report at, you know, the, the stats 20 games in, if he's still shooting it at this level, 60% from the corners and things like that, they're going to say like, Hey, we got to keep him. We got to at least be a little closer to him. So that might change in all of that stuff, but he is shown so, so more proficiency than we thought and I think we we're ready for in that regard and I think you know the stuff he said about his defense was really solid he's a little bit skinny I think that's where Pascal killed him was in the post last night and really kind of worked him over and and it was even Scotty Barnes took him down a few times into the post but on the perimeter his defense is solid like I think there's a lot there to like with all, all those things it's going to be a little bit of a project I think he's on the right track my concerns with this team is just, you know, that game against Toronto, he goes in four minutes in the fourth quarter or first quarter. I don't think he touches the ball, you know, I, besides maybe inbounding it, I don't think he had a touch. And I think that's one of those things with this, with this team, his development's going to matter. He's going to be really important for them. He's not, I don't know if he's going to get those opportunities that we need him to get with the ball so that we can see those things, him make the next pass, him make the right, read off of the other things and then on top of it a lot of times he's just standing in the corner now granted wide open there are times i want him to find a way to cut find an angle find a lane to cut to the basket and and, and make a move i'll tell you this internally they're really impressed with him and they agree he's kind of ahead of where they thought he would be in terms of his feel i don't mind the level of non-involvement just because i'm okay with 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 small baby steps for him mm -hmm. And this is just going to be the reality of of playing with Jordan Poole and Kyle Kuzma um, on a team that is two and eight, twenty second in offense, twenty sixth in defense. On on pace for, I, I I have not bothered to look it up because I don't care enough. I haven't seen a defensive rebounding rate this bad in a really. They cannot get any rebounds. I mean, they're dead last by like a significant amount in defensive rebounding. Uh, but Kulubali, thumbs up so far. Um, you want to talk about Keontae George or Anthony Black? Your pick. Let's go with Keontae George. We've been on the East Coast for quite a bit. Let's 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 slide. Oh, west we for have. A You're right. Let's let's hit the Utah Jazz. Keontae George, seven points, five assists. That's the that's the best part. Forty six assists, seventeen turnovers. Talking similar to Sasser, like oh oh, for a rookie, that's good. And for a team that. Just could not stop turning the ball over uh, with all of these shoot first guards. This is the price of of the Mike Conley trade. They're paying the sort of delayed price of, oh, we don't have a, a regular point guard. Their last in turnover rate, three and seven on the season, 16th in offense, 28th in defense. Their offense is killing their defense. Um, but a bright spot, I think, despite some bad shooting numbers, I still would consider Camp the Georgia bright spot. Would you, or are you concerned by the 38%? 31% on threes. No, I, I consider him a, a big bright spot. And, you know, look, they, they moved him into the starting lineup the last two games. 
and their offensive rating with him in the starting lineup, I have it written down, 121.8 in 40. And, and that's just 43 minutes, but that's him in this, you know, that's what happens, right? Like that's the thing with him in the starting unit. And I think that's a big number. Now with that might change or whatnot. I just think what he brings to the table, he does something I thought I had a preconception of him coming in. I don't watch a ton of college basketball through the course of the season. I try to catch up draft time and, and, and try to do homework in the summer and, and catch up. But my conception of him was, yo, he's another gunner. And when the jazz drafted him, I said, gosh, they're, they're going to have another gunner with Clarkson with, with everybody that they got. Like, this is going to be a bit difficult. He's come in and the ball flies around the court. It moves. It doesn't stick in his hands. He's making the right rotations. He's making the right passes. You know, he had a pass. Uh, I think it was against Memphis. He's coming off a double drag. John Collins slips and he's going from his right crosses over to his left, right I, off the bounce, throws it right to Collins. Collins doesn't shoot I, off. I of know this. I know the exact pass. Collins was almost at the rim and it's a side. It's a sidearm lefty slingshot. I mean, it is a slingshot. It hits him right in the hands. It was, it was so good that I was like, I thought he was right-handed. Like I had to go just to double check. Cause that's his off hand that he's making that pass with. And I'm looking at it just going like, I watched that. That was more impressive than the 11 assists he had in that game. Like that blew me away. And I think that's the thing when you're watching him, like he's bringing that to the jazz and that's exactly what they need right now. You know, you talked about it. They traded Mike Connolly. It's been trying to find that point guard. Now this is two games as a starter. I don't know what's going to happen when everybody gets healthy and how things kind of work out. Walker Kessler's out. Uh, and for a, a, a while, so this might be the starting unit for a bit. Let's see how it all flows. But like, man, I don't know if they can take him out of the starting lineup at this point. He's bringing flow to their offense. I don't think they should, um, because the passing has been good. He's a willing pull-up shooter. Teams are daring him to shoot. He only shot so-so in college. Um, but I like the form, and I, I like his. He's got just good craft, change of pace, has a good first step, good lob passer. Like, he's found John Collins on some nice lobs. Kessler is a good lob catcher when he's healthy. I, I Look, the shooting, we'll see, but I, I'm very impressed with the passing. And like you said, this team just needs an organizer who's just not throwing the ball all over the gym. I do think, Mo, I I took the under on the Jazz coming into the season, mostly because of this this exact thing we're talking about, the guards and the turnovers. If they continue to be like a non, you know, like 12th to 15th in the West, I think this becomes a really interesting team to watch because you look at what they have. George is pretty good. Like, I don't know what he's going to be, but he's pretty good. We haven't seen either of their other first-round picks at all, Hendricks and Sensenbaugh. Markinen is really, really good. Yes. Voted him most improved player last year. Can shoot the hell out of it. It feels like we're almost seeing the peak of Lowry Markinen. Like he and, and I mean that as, as a play initiator and creator for others. It just kind of hasn't it, it he's averaging 1.6 assists and 1.7 turnovers a game. He may be, and this is totally fine, an all-star who doesn't ever crack all NBA. And so that's a good player. It's not like a great, great player. Kessler got off to a horrible start this season and he began looking like himself before getting injured. And even while starting off slowly, opponents are still only shooting 44% at the rim against him, which is very good. <laughs> um, They have a million draft picks. We all know that. Um, their own draft picks may be the most valuable of the million draft picks they own, but they've got Cleveland picks, Minnesota picks, up the wazoo. You just look at them, and I, I would just love to have a couple of drinks with their front office. It's like, what, what do you actually think you have here? Remember, they tried to get Drew Holiday. That was a real thing. I don't know how yeah. hard they tried, but they tried fairly hard. What, what, what do you think you have here? How? How worried are you that you don't have the the foundational piece yet, but you got some interesting – like, what does it amount to? It's too early to have that conversation, but I they're an interesting team to keep an eye on. Yeah, I mean, I think there's going to be a lot of interest in a lot of their guys. I mean, you know, this is – see how it flows, like, 
there's going to be teams that might need a scoring punch and might try to make take a flyer on Clarkson and things like that. Like there's they're they're going to be in a weird, very interesting position come February because I think they will be right around you know 13, 14 in the West, and I think this is going to be one of those things of like, hey, we need to make sure we get the young guys rec- reps. Uh, you know, to, uh, Hendricks needs to get minutes at some point. You know, just get him out of the G League and into the 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 run with the jazz and get him some nba experience like it'll be interesting to see where they go with that stuff because yeah they're they're not that different to me than what the spurs were before they got victor webanyama a lot of interesting guys but not the guy and i think they need to find themselves find a way to get the guy for them whether it's through the draft trades whatnot uh we we know they have a definitely uh a large cupboard full of assets if they want to try to make a move and on George, it does feel like it's it's sometimes kind of all or nothing for him just in terms of role. Like he's either on the ball running the offense or he's in the corner while the other guys run the offense. And there's just not a lot of connectivity from one to the other, which is fine. They're young guards, a lot of, a lot of strange pieces, but thumbs up to him so far. Um, let's go to the Orlando Magic because they're five and four with the number two defense in the NBA. Um, and Anthony Black has started – to crack the rotation, he started a couple of games with Markel Fultz out. Gary Harris has been injured, so there's been bench minutes for him. Um, shooting well, you know, he's only 5 of 10 on threes. People are going to give him that shot. Interesting player. Big, defense first, hungry rebounder, smart passer and cutter. Just the Magic just don't have any shooting really anywhere, um, and he fits right into that. But he makes winning basketball plays, and he has peaked. He has done enough to pique my curiosity about how he fits with a Magic team that long term needs to figure out who are the guards on our team going forward because we know who the forwards are. We have a pretty good center for you know for now and probably for later too. I love Wendell Carter Jr. He's a very good player. He's hurt all the time, but he's very good when he plays. Suggs is kind of starting to happen. Uh, right. which is which is really exciting but long term the guard thing is do we have it in house or are we going to have to rush the process here and try to trade some stuff for an outside guard anthony black looks like he's going to get some chances to give them some information on an nba court what have you thought so far i think he is the perfect example of what a connector is going to look like in a few years like, I think he's a great connector for them. And I, I, I that means I don't think he can be a lead guard for them in terms of what they need. But he does a great job. Look, he goes, stands in the corner, doesn't shoot a ton of threes. You talked about it, five out of ten. You know, it, it, it's, you know, but he's going to take them when they're there. But he's also going to make the right pass, the swing pass, the good to great pass, the San Antonio Spurs thing. You know, he's, he's going to make the right reads. He cuts. He does all those things. He feels the game really well. You need those guys. Those guys are really important for your team in general in the in the long run. But they need he's not going to be the guy that I'm going to feel confident going like, here, run our offense. You know, and I think this team has some interesting playmakers. I think they get a lot of playmaking from Paolo Bonchero. I think he's he does a good job with that stuff, but they still need to find the guard as you're as you're talking about. I don't know if it's on their roster actually. This is a team I think that's a a, a great landing spot should uh, Portland decide to move off of uh, Malcolm Brogdon. Like that's a that's a good Brogdon team for them. Like I think that would help them massively. And I think this is a good I think he's a good pairing with Brogdon in terms of continuing to connect and and keeping the ball flying and moving. Is there is their defense legit? Man, it's that I I think so i'm nervous to say fully commit and say yes but i i, I what, think what are so. they I think... what are they do what are they doing well because you look at them they don't have sort of a, a classic rim protector right um they have all these feisty guards but they have good size across but they have good size at every position they have guys who compete defensively at every position is that just all it is is there anything schematically that's interesting that you've noticed I haven't seen anything that's blown me away schematically from them, but I, I, and and I feel like it's kind of like, Oh, they try hard. So it's a cop out answer. But I think it's one of those things where it's like, they compete really hard. And then when Jonathan Isaac comes in, like, you know, 
it's a whole nother level of, of defensive intensity rises up and he brings a lot of juice in terms of that side. And, and, you know, like, I feel like as NBA fans, we've been robbed with the injuries because he, he would have been making all defensive teams and maybe even making a run at a defensive player of the year. Had he stay healthy at, at, at any point in his career? Cause he was just his length all he's over everywhere. the place. Yeah. It's just, you just can't stop him. And he's making plays where you're just like, yeah, you shouldn't be able to do that. And like, he's able to, and I think that's, that's part of their defensive stuff. But I think in general, they're all bought in. And I think that's a credit to, we don't talk about him a, much, a lot, but Jamal Mosley's done a fantastic job coaching this team, you know, as a first time head coach, when he came in, he's Agreed. done a, gr- he's done a great job kind of just building a culture there. They all kind of, the vibe is really good with the team. They all play hard. They all work together. Like I, I, I just love the vibe of the old Orlando magic in general. And I think they bring in the pieces that they need smartly and it works well for them. Long time listeners and readers know that I have some sort of weird Orlando magic fetish. I just can't ever stop talking about them or thinking about them. They're five and four. They played tonight. So they may be five and five or six and four. They will be one of those things. There are no ties in the NBA. They will not be five and four <laughs> and one uh, by the time this airs. Um, I I think they're worth watching, obviously, for Bancaro and Franz Wagner, neither of whom is shooting well at all, but both of them are very, very good players. Defensively, they're first in forcing turnovers. That I'm curious if that if they can sustain a top five turnover rate. But they're taking care of the glass, third in defensive rebounding. They just play hard. You mentioned Isaac. At the beginning of the year, they're bringing. They have to bring. He. He. It feels like he'll be on a lifetime minutes restriction. Just it will just always be a minutes restriction. At the beginning of the year, he was just purely part of the bench, like Cole Anthony, Mo Wagner, Jonathan Isaac, Gary Harris, blah blah blah, just bench mob, and then you know stagger a starter. Last couple games, they've begun to squeeze him in to some more starter heavy lineups. We've even seen like the Bancaro Isaac four five front court I really hope we get to see some some sustained look at what all of those different iterations of the magic look like even like Franz Isaac Paolo Carter like let's get crazy and huge I yeah. want to see all of it him and Suggs Suggs is up to 35 percent on threes he just looks more confident offensively I've always wondered, like, does he have a position? Is he, He's not quite a one. He doesn't uh, shoot well enough to be a two. He kind of has to. I think he's going to have to be a combo guard. That's fine. Like, you can be that kind of player. Like, Marcus Smart is the go-to comp. If he, if he just looks a little better offensively, like, Isaac and Suggs are worth your attention in the next 20 to 30 games. What are they actually bringing to the table? Because if one of those guys pops, particularly Suggs, this becomes a pretty interesting team. Yeah, I mean, it, we got to talk about Suggs in the sense of, like, just his toughness as a kid. Because just think about this way. He was such a disappointment his rookie year. Like, there were times where I was like, I gosh, I don't know. Like, I was really concerned about him. And I was high coming in, high on him coming into the draft. And then was, you know, watching him in these games going like, wow, that that might be a, a, a big mistake. And now he's, like you said, looking more comfortable, slowly but surely progressing. They need him to make shots in, in, in to a degree, and thirty five percent from three, okay. But like, we, probably needs to get that a little bit better. Probably needs to get that closer to thirty seven. It's hard, you know, in in, in that sense. But teams are going to leave him to go double Paolo and things like that. And and on top of that too, it's not just standing around for the three point shot. Cool. When your guy goes to double, go cut, do something. Be be more than just one thing. And I think that's the the idea there with him i think he has a chance to pop i've been very surprised and and pleasantly surprised with how he's kind of played this season and i want to see it continue and i think think we're progressing that way i I, this orlando team zach like i'm i'm excited man like i love watching them you know you're talking about your 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 fetish with them i love watching them i love watching paolo does i'm gonna do a little bit of an ode to paolo like his playmaking i think is the thing that surprised me from his first summer league game on and if you go Five watch and a half the, the, game, the game right now, yeah, you go watch his game against Milwaukee. There were two plays back to back, you know, one in the post, uh, 
Giannis sags off of Wagner. He kicks it immediately right out to him. Clean three. He gets one in the mid post elbow area. You know, uh, I forget who cut. It was Mo Wagner. Mo. I should always know the, when the other Mo yeah. score. Yes. Uh, Mo Mo <laughs> Mo Wagner cuts underneath the basket. You know, uh, behind Giannis, and he just throws a nice little dime to him for an easy bucket. Like he's such a willing passer. In that sense, it goes a long way to keep their offense flowing and things like that. Like this is a team that really is on the rise. You know, they're 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 not far away from being in the playing tournament and and being a team that we can kind of start counting on in the playoffs. Yeah, and and to your point, one of the things I I like to go back to Anthony Black is that because he's a non shooter, they've used him as a screener in inverted yeah. pick and rolls with Paolo, and he can make plays out of that in open space because he's a point guard. The problem is everyone will just go under screens on every magic shooter because none of them can shoot. And at some point they're going to need some shooting. Um, but he also had a play in that Mexico city game where he was on DeJounte Murray, Anthony black and Murray rejected a pick full speed, full blast, like a, a zooming away from the pick an acceleration that 90% of NBA defenders are behind the play. Anthony black slid his feet, stood DeJounte Murray up, swiped down, and took the ball. And I was like, whoa, okay. Okay, Anthony Black, I see that. I see that. Okay, we got to wrap up. I'm just going to say some names. You ready? Andre Jackson yeah. Jr. playing for the Bucks, who needs I need some juice. Uh, Jaime Hawkins Jr., we're going to talk about the Heat later uh, on later episodes. Just the do-it-all, jack-of-all-trades. It's annoying how Heat-like he is. Jordan Hawkins I just, I can't, I don't even know how to talk about the Pelicans. <laughs> He's been thrust into this like heavy usage role because the whole team is hurt. Zion is making strange post-game comments about the program and he's just trying to buy in. Zion's shots are the same. Pick and roll, ball handling volume, the same. Usage rate, the same. He's just shooting 51.5% on twos, which for Zion is like bad. Massively low. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, and uh, Tumani Kamara in Portland, I've enjoyed your work, but you can't you just not make enough I, shots. Um, I just the one thing about uh, Kamara because that one thing I love is just he guards everybody. Yes, you go he watch does. that Laker game. He, he's on Austin Reeves to Anthony Davis. Like it was pretty impressive watching him in that game. Mota Kill, what should we look for from you this week? What do you got? You got what? What? What do you got? Any more things coming out? One more. I got. Maybe? I got a. I I got I got a, a a one mo thing possibly coming out. Uh, I have uh, I'm doing uh my own power rankings on YouTube. Uh, oh. so I do like a little video power rankings on YouTube. Uh, just go search. Uh, it's called the Jump Ball Power Rankings. If you search that, you'll 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 find that. And then uh, I have some uh, I I might have an article or two uh, drop in this week. Uh, one uh, possibly on the Athletic. Very nice. Yeah, you you're writing appears here and there it's appeared at Bleacher <laughs> Report before it's appeared at The Athletic before this guy look the, the, you were in the NBA you know the game inside out and it's thank you for coming on and sharing your insight we'd love to have you back uh, if you are willing Mo to kill thank you sir no thank you for having me